Welcome to this week's episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Andrew Seidel, the Director of Strategic Response here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I'm Elizabeth Cavell, an Associate Counsel here at FFRF. And as usual, if you've got questions about what we're discussing today or anything related to FFRF, just type your questions in the comments or you can email them to askanatheist at FFRF.org. Today we are going to be talking with Chrissy Stroop, a writer, activist, and ex-evangelical, ex-evangelical as she says, about her work. But before we get to Chrissy, Andrew, your book, The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American, uh, came out in May. Uh, it's been selling well. You've been touring around the country promoting it, and you have got some more dates coming up. I do. I have quite a few dates coming up. I'm doing a Texas tour from August 22nd to the 25th. I will be in San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and Austin. Uh, while I'm in Austin, I will also be on the Atheist Experience, uh, the TV show with Matt Dillahunty, which I'm really excited about. Then I'm off to Denver on September 7th, and then to the University of Louisville for a Constitution Day debate with this guy named Mark David Hall on the question, did America have a Christian founding? So if you're in Kentucky, be sure to come out for that. And for details, including dates, times, locations, and more, you can visit our website, ffrf.org slash outreach slash events. And you can find information there about all of our staff's events. Um, FFRF co-president Dan Barker has some coming up in Spain and Puerto Rico. Annie Laurie Gaylor will be in Amsterdam. Um, another FFRF attorney, Sam Grover, will be in North Carolina soon. So that's ffrf.org slash outreach slash events. Now... Let's invite on our guest, Chrissy Stroop. Chrissy has a BA in history and German and a PhD in modern Russian history from Stanford. She is an influencer on Twitter and the creator of the viral hashtags, empty the pews, Christian alt facts, and expose Christian schools, among others. Right, and she has taught at universities in Moscow and in Florida. Uh, right now, Chrissy works full-time as a writer, a speaker, and an advocate for the ex-evangelical community and movement. Um, and ex-evangelical is a term we'll obviously be getting into. Uh, her writings appeared in Playboy, Foreign Policy, Religion Dispatches, Political Research Associates, and other outlets. And her personal blog, Not Your Mission Field, can be found at cstroop.com. Her new book, Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church, uh, which she co-edited, comes out in December, December 1st. It's available for pre-order right now. Chrissy, welcome to Ask an Atheist. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Thank you, Andrew. It's, it's nice to be with you. Well, it's great to have you on. And I think we'll start with exvangelical. Uh, I mean, this is a term you sort of created uh, because you left the evangelical faith. And we'd really like to hear sort of what drove you to leave the evangelical evangelical Christianity and how you are building a community uh, for others who have done the same. Sure. Um, thanks. Well, first, I should say that I didn't create the, um, the portmanteau or the hashtag okay. exvangelical. Uh, Blake Chastain did, and he has a podcast of the same name. And apparently someone created it before him and used it for a blog, but then abandoned the blog. So... The idea has been out there for a while, but it, it's Blake who uh, really made something out of the term, and then we all kind of ran with it. And um, my own visibility on Twitter has to do with my ability to speak to, uh, as you said, I'm a historian of modern Russia and lived in Moscow recently, so I'm able to speak to both um, Russian policy, foreign policy, Russian politics, um, what's going on in Russia today, and the American Christian right because of my experience growing up Christian right, and the combination of those two things has been something that people want to understand uh, in, in this time, really since the 2016 election, where a Russian influence campaign helped Donald Trump come to power, and he's also backed by the American Christian right. And in fact, those are not simply two independent factors, but there are a lot of interconnections there. For example, I've published research on the World Congress of Families, looking at how there's a lot of international networks and projects devoted to pursuing um, an anti-woman, anti-LGBTQ, uh, pro right wing religion agenda. Um, as for my own personal journey, um, I was born in a small town in northern Indiana where most people are farmers as well as whatever else they do. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, um, I then moved to a north suburb of Indianapolis with my family when I was about almost five years old. 
And um, from the time I was in first grade, I was sent to these, um, you know, hardline right wing Christian schools, the kind of Christian schools that are tend to be labeled Christian schools or Christian academies. And in fairness, we have to say there's a big difference between that and, say, a Jesuit academy, which will teach you evolution and that sort of thing. Um, Christian schools, typically evangelical church schools or fundamentalist schools that might be run out of churches or they might be sort of K through 12 independent schools, um, they're... Um, they can be significantly worse than Catholic schools. Some Catholic schools are just as bad, but um, they're pretty much right-wing indoctrination machines. So did you, uh, did you learn, like, were you indoctrinated with creationism and things like that in the school? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I went to kind of, I, I, well, I went to a couple of these schools. The one in Colorado Springs, where my family lived from 1993 to um, 1995, was even more hardline than the one I graduated from in Indianapolis. But the one I graduated from in Indianapolis um, still taught us young earth creationism, even though it also offered AP biology. In fact, I took AP biology, and our AP biology teacher showed us young earth creationists and flood geology videos, and he would in not the, teach in us the AP the, biology class with the yes, national I mean, standards that are required. <laughs> you, wow. Uh, yeah, you can get away with that. I mean, so we still had a regular secular college textbook, you know. Uh, but he would not teach us the evolution chapters. He did tell us to uh, read them on our own and regurgitate them for the exam. So lying for Jesus is okay. Wow. You know? <laughs> wow. Uh, and yeah, after that, um, you know, I was kind of starting to deconstruct this kind of fundamentalist religion from about 16 years old, but I really didn't want to rock the boat with my family. I always felt different growing up in this environment. Um, and yet it was a painful struggle for me to to break away. And uh, I was kind of trying to do that via academia. And I just, I lived in my head a lot as a kid and I became very cerebral about things. And I couldn't even figure out that queerness was a factor in that till I was in my 30s, um, living in Moscow, teaching at a Russian university. And um, yeah, so, you, you know. Do you recall, was, when, you were, when you were doing all that thinking, do you recall sort of what the first maybe domino to fall was? What was the first thing that really kind of started pushing you away from the evangelical religion? So I remember, um, you know, having just some kind of negative reactions and feelings to how hard they pushed uh, purity culture in seventh grade in Colorado Springs. You know, we took this day where they uh, took us on a so-called retreat and then separated the boys and the girls and engaged in a lot of Fear mongering and pushing of hashtag Christian alt facts, you know, basically uh, don't do anything with any uh, boyfriend or girlfriend that you wouldn't do with someone who is married to someone else because they're probably not going to marry you in the future. And you should also be keeping yourself pure for your future spouse. And by the way, if you have sex, you're all going to get horrible diseases. Condoms never work. And would you now like to prayerfully consider signing this purity pledge? Uh, you know, um, it was very manipulative. I think everybody signed the pledges because uh, we didn't know if we would be expelled if we didn't. In fact, one person kind of disappeared from the school sometime after that, and everyone said it was because she didn't sign the purity pledge, although I think that's probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people disappear in Christian schools, and then you get all these rumors about, well, was it alcohol? Was it some pot at a party? Because, uh, you know, people don't know, them, whatever. <laughs> well, and there's, there's tons of peer pressure, I imagine, at these schools to conform. I mean, that religion relies on that to, to propagate itself. Uh, but, yeah, the purity culture sort of subculture in evangelicalism is, is uh, both fascinating and terrifying. Right. Yeah, it's just one of the many parts of evangelical subculture that really makes you hate yourself if you take it seriously. And um, I think I really started to deconstruct this kind of faith more from about the age of 16 when I read the entire Bible through for the first time. And I had problems with things like divinely ordained genocide, and I had doubts about inerrancy. You know, you could find some obvious examples of contradictions where certain numbers don't add up about the same event in one book versus another. And I went to talk to a pastor about that. Uh, he was our pastor at the time, and he was also a Bible teacher at my Christian school, I think a bit later. Uh, in any case, he uh, seemed very understanding at first. He gave me an apologetics book to read. I don't remember which one it was. It wasn't <laughs> Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel, but it was in question and answer format. It was very glib. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just, I still had doubts. So I went back and told him that again. And then the problem was with me. And he said that yeah. I was clearly harboring sin in my life. Those were his words. And 
opening myself up to demonic influence and he quasi exercised me in that Protestant way, you know, where you just speak and pray against the demons. Uh, but that really scares you as a kid. Anyway, yeah. it took me, it took me a lot longer to sort through all this stuff and to also sort through the fact that the reason I felt different, um, initially was probably because of, um, repressed queerness that it took me some time to recognize and come to terms with. That seems to be also one of the themes is that you as a believer are at fault if you have doubts. You know, you're, it's just your faith isn't great enough. You could, you could never have enough faith, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes they kind of pull a bait and switch with that and say, well, everyone has doubts. Here, you know, go read this book. It'll obviously take care of it. And then it's, oh, you're not reading the Bible through the Holy Spirit. You're clearly harboring sin in your life. <laughs> Once you can't come to the point where you're like, oh, yeah, inerrancy makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So how long was the deconstruction process? Um, when did you consider yourself, you know, completely um, post-evangelical? Uh, uh, and how do you identify now in terms of religious or atheist or mm -hmm. even still Christian? Uh, so I graduated from high school in 1999. I then went to Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. And um, I'd say that after my third year of college, when I studied abroad uh, in England and Germany, I really understood that I couldn't consider myself evangelical anymore, but this was a pretty tragic thing for me because, again, I didn't want to rock the boat with my family because it's it comes with such a social cost, you know, when you break away from the religion and politics of the Christian right. And also, you can't just break away from the politics and keep the religion because they consider it all the same, really. So, you know, they demand absolute conformity. And... Um, I admitted this to a few people and, um, you know, it just made them sad. It wasn't, they weren't really very receptive. And um, I went on to teach English in Russia for a year and then go to grad school to get my PhD in Russian history. And um, I just kind of slowly stopped considering myself a Christian. I tried to hold on to the label for a pretty long time. So it's hard for me to put a point on it. I started speaking out for, you know, separation of church and state and LGBTQ rights uh, sometime, I think maybe a couple of years before Prop 8 in California, which was 2008, but definitely by the time of Prop 8, you know, I um, came out um, against that and for same-sex marriage um, and was speaking publicly about those things. But to really start to become publicly critical of evangelical evangelicalism, evangelical subculture as such, you know, it was July 2015 that I, or was it 2014? I'll have to check. But anyway, that I published um, an, an essay that was just scathing um, and caused about, a lot about of social About evangelicalism. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, it was on religion dispatches, but it was then picked up by uh, Salon and Alternet. So it went somewhat viral. And um, that caused hard conversations with my family that honestly, I sort of knew I wouldn't be able to force any other way. So I, I used my evangelical <laughs> passive aggression for what is hopefully the greater good. <laughs> well, at least it paid off a little bit. <laughs> yeah, from that time on, I've been uh, an increasingly visible public figure speaking out about these things. Um, and since the 2016 election in particular, this exvangelical Twitter, because hashtag exvangelical works better than hashtag exevangelical, I guess, uh, is one of the reasons that it's become popular hashtag, um, it, it started to become a thing. And that definitely hasn't been uh, just me by any stretch of the imagination, but I have been able to help popularize it by just being one of the more visible figures that uh, is a part of that community and movement. And you now have taken that and you've co-edited this volume, uh, your new book, Empty the Pews, which is available for pre-order right now on Amazon. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, it comes out, I think, December 1st. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. It comes out December 1st with Epiphany Publishers. Uh, yeah, Lauren O'Neill, my co-editor, and I have been working on this for years, and we're really excited to see it come to fruition. There's, there's a number of books out there uh, that you could compare it to in the sense that they give voice to people who have left 
religion, but I do think ours is unique in a couple of ways. You know, unlike um, Kaya Oak's book, The Nuns Are All Right, for example, uh, we focus a lot more on people who left religion entirely. Uh, a couple of people are still, you know, somewhat spiritual or religious in, in the book, but most of them are, are not. You know, it's mostly atheist contributors. And we also had people write their own personal essays rather than use interviews for this. And then some, some other uh, older books that have come out have tended to focus just more on the cerebral and intellectual issues. But we wanted to produce a really human book with um, personal essays. And it includes ex-Mormons, ex-Catholics, and ex-Evangelicals, or we sometimes now also call them ex-Vs as a further uh, abbreviation of <laughs> ex-Evangelical. Uh, has a foreword by Frank Schaefer, who, of course, helped build the Christian right with his father, Francis Schaefer, who is... Um, a was a, a major um, Christian light figure, you know, one of the people who wrote the books that gives them their, their ideology credibility, at least in their minds, and um, sometimes, unfortunately, in other people's minds. And so Frank Schaefer left all that behind, and he's now a very vocal critic of evangelicalism, so we're, we're really proud to have him as a part of the book. And, um, I, and I, yeah, we hope it will have um, a big impact. I got a chance to scan uh, briefly yesterday uh, when you sent me uh, one of the early versions of it, uh, some of the essays, and it looks like that there's this is also a group of younger writers um, for the most part. Is that accurate, or am I am I off on that? For the most part, that's true. Uh, so most of the contributors would be millennials or younger Gen Xers, with a couple of exceptions, and um, I think I think that also has has value because. As we look at the rise of the nuns, you know, there's a, there's a big difference in terms of age demographics there, right? And younger people are abandoning religion much, much faster than older members of the population. So we wanted to give voice to what's happening in this generational moment. And in our introduction, we link it to bigger things that are happening in society and politics right now. You know, we're, we're looking at a generation of people that uh, came of age with kind of the full Christian right culture wars project developed and we're just thrust into it, we're sort of subjected to this massive experiment in social engineering without our informed consent. And I mean, what kind of six-year-old can provide informed consent to be told that there are all these liberals out there killing babies and we have to stop them? Yeah. Uh, which I was told at six years old, and I think even before. I mean, I remember uh, the second church that we went to as a, when I was a kid was a Baptist church, and they were really big on that rhetoric and on the, the fake uh, crisis, the world, the phony crisis pregnancy centers, you know, that... Uh, tell lies and don't provide comprehensive women's health care. So is it, did you notice a common theme with the authors? Uh, you know, things that made them or pushed them away from their conservative religions? Well, it's not a coincidence that um, most of the authors are women, a solid majority, and there are a lot of queer narratives in there as well, because women and queer people are disproportionately affected by... Uh, you know, the intensely patriarchal nature of uh, conservative Christianity. Uh, so those are definitely themes that run through it. There are some intellectual themes that run through it as well. Of course, we, we're well aware from cognitive science these days that our reasoning and our emotions can't really be, be separated as people sometimes want to do. It's not so neat and tidy as, as all that, which is part of why, or it's at least related to the fact that you often can't reason people out of things that they're deeply emotionally invested in, which is another reason that we wanted to make this a very literary and, and human and relatable book with the personal essays format. Uh, we also have uh, a number of people of color who contributed to it and grew up in, um, you know, conservative evangelical subculture in, say, immigrant churches, um, a Chinese American church in California, for example. Um, and so... Um, obviously, they're also disproportionately affected by the, the politics of conservative Christianity, which is mostly white for a reason. It, it does serve to uphold patriarch white, white supremacist patriarchy in the United States. Yeah. Uh, speaking of politics, one of the things you said earlier um, really caught my attention, which was that you felt like as a young person in um, evangelicalism that you didn't have the choice to keep the religious um, ideology in your life and jettison the, the political elements. Um, I'm really curious about that, um, especially now as millennials, of, of course, are still, especially post-2016, um, clearly grappling with um, their religion and the politics of their religion. How did that 
make itself apparent to you? I mean, you talked about being six years old and being told about liberals and abortion, um, you know, ideology. How did that make itself clear to you that it, it's not an option to be <laughs> an evangelical Christian and also a liberal Democrat or whatever the political label would be? And how do you think evangelicals are experiencing that now who are younger um, millennials? Um, thanks, Elizabeth. That's a great question. And um, in my life, it made itself clear in just so many ways. Um, you know, sometimes you hear political statements quite overtly from the pulpit. Uh, but, you know, uh, just the way people talk when you grow up in that environment, liberal, they literally use it as an antonym for Christian. And so they conflate the two things in your mind. And um, my high school is not subtle about this, and neither is uh, neither are the curricula that are often used in Christian schools and homeschooling. So because this was a Christian school that wanted to be more respectable, that brags about having higher SAT scores and college placement rate rates and so forth, even though they try to funnel kids into evangelical colleges, you know, we didn't have all a Becca and Bob Jones, but we certainly had some of it. The government textbook in um, senior year of high school was very much a, a God and country, Christian alt facts, Judeo-Christian America kind of textbook. And um, juniors and seniors at my high school, Heritage Christian School in Indianapolis, were sent annually on a field trip to a convention of an organization that was then called Citizens Concerned for the Constitution. And it's now called Advance America, and its website bills itself as Indiana's sort of number one pro-homeschooling, pro-Christian schools, pro-family organization, and we know what that's code for. <laughs> um, these, these were like Tea Party before the Tea Party kind of conventions. Mm -hmm. This was not a neutral civics lesson. And they had voter guides, um, which, you know, they didn't necessarily directly tell you to vote for the Republicans, but they were grading them on things based like opposition to abortion. So obviously you were supposed to vote for Republicans. And we stuffed envelopes and sent out those voter guides. Wow. You know, as Christian school kids, we were mobilized to do this sort of thing. I was also taken to an anti-abortion protest as a kid um, when I was 11 through a church that we went to. And my dad was the music pastor at that time. Uh, so it's really, it's not especially subtle. Wow. And, and you touch on that in your new Playboy article, The Gospel According to Mike Pence. Uh, you touch on mm -hmm. this sort of the, the tie between religion and politics. Uh, but also there's, there's a really nice line in there that uh, you said, if we internalize the truth that Christians are just as capable of evil as members of any other group, we would not be affording Christians the unquestioned trust that lets theocrats thrive. And so you were kind of talking about in the context of labeling these people fake Christians. Uh, the article was, mm -hmm. was really fascinating uh, and I, I'd love for you to expound on it for our listeners, viewers. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, so I pretty fiercely object to labeling the kind of Christians that I grew up among and as <clears throat> fake Christians. Uh, it's, it's ahistorical. It, it has no basis in sociology or, or anthropology. A, um, a group of people belongs to a religion, you know, if they have, I would say, a communally mediated interpretation of that religion's sacred texts and a communally mediated praxis. And there's no hard line between religion and politics. Really, there's no such thing as a political religion because any human community has a politics. So uh, I approach this largely from a sociological perspective. And um, from, from that point of view, you know, community is, it's, it's, uh, it's debatable what exactly defines religion, but community is generally seen as a key element in defining religion. One can have an individual spiritual practice perhaps, but, Religion has something to do with this community that it has its certain standards, ideals, texts, traditions, and so forth. Uh, so there simply is no rational basis whatsoever to call evangelicals who support Trump fake Christians. They square it with their faith. They do read the Bible. Um, you know, I grew up reading uh, the Bible pretty much every day. We were certainly encouraged to read it every day, to have our quiet times and devotionals. So yeah, they read it selectively. And uh, yeah, atheists and uh, typically test better in terms of actual knowledge of the Bible versus evangelicals, but they know what they're supposed to know from it. And, um, you know, they, they do have a specific kind of relationship to it. So they absolutely are Christians. And uh, I think it's very important to make the fundamental point that Christians can be terrible people and Christians can do awful and destructive things. I mean, it's, it's also, we don't want to dehumanize people and it's also possible to be 
uh, a decent person sort of at 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 root, but be pulled into uh, a toxic ideological community and do great harm on a social level, um, even though you wouldn't necessarily want to do harm to people. So, you know, I don't want to say all evangelicals are, are bad people, uh, but the politics that, you know, around 80% of white evangelicals support are certainly evil. Uh, and yet we can't seem to get the media to focus on, on that and to unpack it in productive ways, even in the era of Trump. I mean, we have made some progress because they're at least now writing articles accusing, even in the Atlantic, uh, accusing evangelicals of hypocrisy, but that doesn't go far enough. Yeah. And when you have all these people shouting fake Christians after Mike Pence tours a concentration camp and says everything is fine, uh, what, what they're doing is, uh, is saying that Christians are not, real Christians are not capable of atrocities. They're accepting a framework of Christian moral supremacism, and we need to reject that framework if we want to have a healthy democracy. I think that's absolutely right. And that, that is one of the central problems. Religion has done a great job of convincing people that anything religious or specifically Christian is inherently good. Uh, when we absolutely know that's, that's not true. I mean, you simply read the Bible and see that that's not true. I mean, the better way to say it is that most Christians are better than their Christianity. Uh, so, but I really appreciated that comment. Yeah, I agree. Um, so you kind of... It, you, you kind of explain this somewhat when you're talking about how um, ultra conservative politics just so permeates um, the evangelical uh, upbringing and the evangelical movement. But um, I'm curious, you've written about how sort of the the election of uh, Donald Trump, which was um, completely on a wave of, of evangelical support, um, we all know that Donald Trump couldn't have won without the support of the evangelical community. Um, you have written about how that kind of surprised no one in the evangelical community or the ex-evangelical community, you know, how that sort of ends justify the means political calculus um, is, is no surprise to um, people like you. So can you talk about sort of the authoritarian strain in evangelicalism um, that you think uh, you know, goes right in line with the evangelical support of Trump and um, just kind of expound on that a little. Sure. Uh, so first I'd say that it, it is a bit of an exaggeration to say that no one in the evangelical community was surprised. Uh, I have talked to a few people who were surprised. I think particularly those who are, um, you know, fresher in their in their deconstruction. Uh, there are some who, who left evangelicalism uh, left their churches because of the widespread Trump support and, and didn't see it coming. And I think that's probably because they wanted to believe the best in the people around them and didn't want to see it coming. But this kind of throws it in your face. But anecdotally, it certainly is my sense that uh, most people who have left evangelicalism, uh, who were raised that way or spent a long time in the movements, were not surprised that evangelicals could go all in for Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, once you take Ted Cruz out of the picture, and he's just as authoritarian as Trump, it's just that he's slicker and he couches it better in evangelical language. But uh, Trump has also learned to parrot those classic evangelical talking points. Like, you know, now he seems to be pretty comfortable saying in America, we don't worship, uh, we don't, what, how's that for We don't worship we government, don't worship, we worship God. We don't worship the state, we worship God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that kind of talking point um, is common in, in evangelicalism. Um, that the community is authoritarian. Well, what I mean by that, uh, if people have read um, Berkeley cognitive psych, uh, scientist George Lakoff, who's now professor emeritus, you could link it to his model of the strict father morality, uh, the strict father type of family, uh, which conservatives project into their politics versus the nurturing parent family, which liberals project into their politics. Um, Evangelicals, by and large, are very devoted to corporal punishments on principle. Um, they don't want their kids to really explore and figure out who they are. They want them to just conform to the way that things are supposed so. to be. And they don't create much space for you to challenge anything uh, without getting shot down. You know, So uh, everyone is supposed to come out with this conservative, uh, heteronormative, 
mold and any deviation from that is is fiercely policed in these communities and you could take examples from christian schools many of them um have skirt checks for example the one that i graduated from apparently doesn't anymore but you know if a if a teacher back in the day thought that a girl's skirt was potentially too short she would make her kneel uh, and see if if the hem reached the floor and she would make this happen in front of everybody you know in a classroom um so this kind of social policing it's just so common i'll give you another example so when um after my first trips to Russia, so this is also in the book, Empty the Pews, it's my contribution, is an essay that was kind of embarrassing and difficult for me to write. And honestly, I kind of kept trying to put, off, put it off and not meet the <laughs> deadline. And Lauren was like, no, no, you have, you have to write this. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, so my first interactions with Russia were actually short-term youth evangelical mission trips in 1999 wow. and 2000. And um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of fucked up stuff that goes on with youth mission trips that uh, some of which I write about in uh, um, in that essay um, and I kind of lost my train of thought there I'm sorry <laughs> that's, that's quite that's quite all right I mean and we're gonna we're gonna actually turn to take some questions in just a second but I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you one one final uh, question just on, I mean, mm -hmm. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the shootings that happened over the weekend and the response to the mass shootings uh, that we see in the evangelical community and by politicians who seem to have adopted this, this line of uh, thoughts and prayers. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. we saw this out of all the officials in Texas, Mike Huckabee. Bruce, do we have a clip or no, we just have uh, what Mike Huckabee said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, he said, uh, he, he's essentially saying that the lack of thoughts and prayers is probably the single biggest factor behind the shootings, which is just, <clears throat> to me, yes, the lack, I mean, thoughts and prayers are inaction. It's the, the, if we only mm -hmm. had more mm -hmm. inaction, we would have fewer mass shootings. Uh, I wonder if you could just weigh in on that, and then we'll take some questions. Sure. Oh, and let me really quickly say, though, I did remember what I was just <laughs> going to say, which is that, which is that uh, all, all that backstory to say that, um, you know, I, I figured out that we were sort of there to convert Orthodox Christians to Protestant Christianity, which was weird. And then <laughs> um, a few years later, I was actually dating a, uh, a Russian Orthodox young woman. And my parents and I, I was back visiting them from college went to the this local Chinese buffet after church, as one does, and ran into <laughs> Christian school teachers and their spouses uh, that my mom works with at the Christian school that I graduated from. And I just happened to mention that I was dating this Russian Orthodox girl. Somehow that came up. And I got grilled for what seemed like 45 minutes about whether she had really accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. You know, they, it was like, wow, they would not let me off the hook. So very, very authoritarian right in, in terms of, of how they police wow. each other. Wow. Um, but yeah, this, um, this this thing that Mike Huckabee has said, that other Republicans have said in light of the recent mass shootings, it's another example of that kind of authoritarianism. And the way that they say these things that are patently false, but they they feel true to them. There may be a cat, there's sort of a capital T truth that the community will protect at all costs. Uh, and so this whole line that, you know, if we just had God in schools, everything would be fine is uh, something that they've been repeating for a long time. I don't know exactly when it was first used in light of school shootings. It probably has been since shortly after Columbine at the very least. But I do know that prayer in schools, you know, objection to Engel v. Vital, which is not actually something that I hear them mention a lot, the specific Supreme Court case, but, you know, to, to complain that the Supreme Court has taken prayer out of schools is something that I grew up with. It was a very common talking point. And, and, and um, Lieutenant Governor yeah, this is Dan Patrick said exactly that uh, over the weekend. He said that it was the, the lack of prayer in schools. That, that I think he said prayer has been banned in schools, which is obviously a lie. Kids can still pray. They just, the school can't impose prayer on children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they have see you at the poll, and they yep. have after school groups, and all these other things where, and the Gideons can get access to schools pretty easily for the most part. So it's really not like prayer is banned in school at all, but we grew up, being told that that was the case. And maybe evangelical kids who went to public schools didn't necessarily believe that as much because they could see that it wasn't true. But certainly it's a very common talking point and a lot of people on the Christian right really push sending your kids to Christian schools and some of the hardest core purists push homeschooling 
as mm-hmm. even more pure and, and better than uh, Christian schools. Right. So yeah, we grew up with that talking point. It's, it's, it's very common. Uh, there's even a tract published by Liberty Baptist Church located somewhere in, in Michigan. If you look up Liberty Gospel tracts, uh, there's one called Killer Kids, which uh, links school shootings to the teaching of evolution, because obviously that's going to turn us all into horrible animals who will just give in to our animalistic impulses. I mean, what we're seeing here is projection, which is another thing that that authoritarians do. They're deeply afraid of themselves. They are not capable of finding an internal locus of uh, authority and meaning. It has to be external. And uh, the community will defend this idea of God at, at all costs, make statements that blatantly contradict fact in order to, to protect that. And so they build up the, these parallel institutions, you know, this whole edifice of alternative facts, which is why I created the hashtag Christian alt facts to um, expose that. Um, thanks for that. And we've got a few questions from Facebook, so I'm going to dive into those. Um, I guess I should take Dan Barker, our co-president's question <laughs> first. Um, this, is actu- this is actually interesting. Um, from from Dan upstairs, do you think evangelicals have abandoned their traditional principle that character counts? How do you think that's been squared with what we're seeing? <laughs> uh, I I wouldn't frame it that way. I mean, on a certain level, yeah, they they did at least when when applied to presidents, but. Uh, on another level, it was never about that. It was whether a president will pursue their agenda and shares their exact set of beliefs uh, about a, their theocratic agenda, agenda that they think should be imposed on society. So they want to re-Christianize our schools. They want to ban abortion. They don't want LGBTQ people to have uh, equal rights. They don't want women to have equal rights and so forth. Uh, so really that's what character means to them uh, particularly if there's a powerful white man in a position of authority they will overlook everything else uh as long as that's in place and that person is advancing their uh fear-based agenda right so right. character doesn't mean moral fiber it means essentially implementing the conservative agenda sure this comes from a very dark view of human nature where they don't think that uh, anyone is capable of being good and they think that only christians can be good some of the time, and all people are basically, you know, horrible, predatory, and will do awful, awful things, but it's worse in the quote-unquote world because they don't have God helping them to ever be good at all. Right. Um, So you have to just impose these things from the top down and and let people be punished for being horrible because we're all horrible anyway. So, you know, you can point out that their ideas for what sex ed should look like as abstinence only Uh, or what their abortion laws that they would hope for would actually do in terms of impact. They don't care that it's extremely punitive, and they don't care that there's collateral damage, for example, women who need a birth control prescription to treat endometriosis. They simply don't care because God is in control. Right. Um, Here's a question from Marie Bergstrom. Uh, Chrissy, do you think that one brand of Christianity, for example, uh, evangelicalism versus Mormonism, um, is more difficult for people to leave? Hmm. Well, evangelicalism, at least in most of its incarnations, and Mormonism are probably similarly difficult to leave. Uh, in some cases, Mormonism might even be more difficult because it's even a more closed-off community. Um, but uh, authoritarian religious groups, or what sociologists and anthropologists sometimes call high demand religious groups are very difficult to leave. Leaving will definitely come with high social and psychological costs. But if you grew up, you know, uh, Episcopalian and in in a not very authoritarian environment and you decide you're not a Christian one day, um, it's probably going to be easier for you to leave your faith community without the same kind of social consequences because they, they simply don't expect everyone to be the same. They don't demand it. They don't fear difference in the same way that these high demand uh, fundamentalist religious communities do. And evangelicalism is fundamentalism. And and they certainly have these sort of self-defense mechanisms that are built in, uh, you know, shunning anybody who leaves their religion as though they no longer exist and and other sort of tactics along those lines, which, uh, you know, the more they employ, I guess, they employ more in high demand religions, I guess you might say. Yeah, I I know people in evangelicalism uh, who practice shunning um, 
there are evangelicals who don't practice shunning. Probably most of them don't formally shun, but um, this can definitely still end up in a, with people cutting off relationships yeah, you know, or and cutting off support. Jehovah's There's going to be a large and... loss of social support. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question. Cool. Um, this is from Hallie Walden. What do you think is the most toxic part of purity culture? And um, are there any redeeming sides to it? <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy, that the uh, most toxic part is a hard question. The second part is easy. Yeah, there's no redeeming sides <laughs> to, to, to purity culture. Purity culture is the conservative religious inflection of rape culture. Uh, you know, maybe the, maybe the most toxic thing about it is that it, it has everything that's, that's wrong with rape culture in it with added heapings of, of guilt that disproportionately affect women and queer people. Yeah, yeah. well, can't say it any better that, or worse <laughs> than that. Um, so... Uh, um, are we out of questions or is there there's one more, one more just came uh, okay, one is it more. necessary to make a geographical move in order to successfully leave um, a church like like an evangelical mm. fundamentalist church? That's a really good question, too. Um, and I think it would it would depend on a, a lot of factors for whatever the individual case is. So, you know, I certainly felt a strong desire after having landed back in Indiana recently, uh, where I was kind of regrouping, seeing if I could make it as a writer and speaker and so forth. Um, after leaving academia, I uh, lived with my parents for 11 months. I still get along with my parents, which is pretty exceptional for a former evangelical. Um, but a lot of people don't. And um, sometimes it is just difficult to escape that community. And it's going to be better, perhaps, for you psychologically if you can make some kind of geographic move, especially if your, whole, if your community is a small one where everyone knows where everyone goes to church. And, um, you know, that kind of social policing happens in the public spaces in a way that like, it might not happen, say, in a random shopping mall in a city as big as Indianapolis, unless you just happen to run into people from the church that you used to go to. Mm -hmm. um, there are high control groups like Jehovah's Witnesses who will try to track people down and will hound them and hound them. Uh, I think most evangelical churches don't do that in such a formal and systematic way. But, you know, sometimes you will get those calls, you will get those texts, you will get those Facebook DMs saying, hey, I see suddenly, you know, there are some changes in your life. Would you like to meet for coffee? And they're going to try to pull you back into the church. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it really depends on how, how you're able to find support where you are, whether or not you really need to leave. But for some people, if at all possible, uh, it's, it's best to get out. I don't want to say there's no hope for people who don't really have the ability to move. Well, um, and hopefully the online community can help. That's what I was going to say. I think, well. I think the ex-evangelical community online can be a big part of that. So it's great work. Um, so I feel we're out of questions, but I feel the need to read this comment, which is just cheering you. Thank you, Chrissy, for taking <laughs> this work on. Much respect from John on Facebook. Um, and we wanted to end on a light note. So, Chrissy, one of your viral hashtags is Epic Christian Fails, um, <laughs> where you showcase unintentionally hilarious uh, things that Christian groups put out into the world. Um, so we've got a graphic here of some funny <laughs> ones that you've that you've blogged about. Yeah, in his grip, that one is, yeah, yikes. I mean, these are very much yikes. <laughs> Connect, uh, engage, grow. Yeah, the <laughs> accidental homoeroticism, there, people could write whole academic articles about that. Um, I, would, I would definitely uh, read one evangelical of those subculture. So I, um, you know, I didn't share that one, but well, I did, I retweeted it. Um, but that was from uh, Christian Nightmares, which is a pretty great account, which yeah. co collects like weird stuff. I did write my most recent Epic Christian Fails blog post about this pickup truck with Christ in quotation marks, which I just think is pretty funny. I mean, he appears to be taking uh, the Lord's name in vain. Right. Against Why is the this person swearing at his, me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at that erratic capitalization on the tailgate. God's way to heaven. Some of my, um, so, <laughs> but some of my favorites are the church signs, and I think we have a couple of those. Like this, this one, do you know what hell is like? Come this Sunday and hear our preacher is hands down my favorite of, the, of these. It, I mean, it's, you, it's, it's projection. It's, 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 it's the, the Freudian slip. Like, this is hell. Come and join us. 
It is pretty great. Um, my favorite one ever is still the first one that I blogged about, and I've been doing this series for, for four months now. So if people want to go to cstroop.com, they can see the uh, Epic Christian Fails series. I think I'm never going to top the first one, which was the Christian Life International softball team. They created a logo, uh, white letters on blue background that says CLI cross well, <laughs> I, wish, sure looks like play. I saw your <laughs> blog um i wish we had the graphic for this it's just it's almost too funny to All be real but it is real <laughs> Wearing this clit t-shirt, and I'm sure none of them could actually find a clitoris. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, what you wrote about that one is hilarious, so people should definitely go check out your <laughs> website and your blog. Um, and your epic Christian fails. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Chrissy. We really appreciated it. Uh, that is our show. Thank you at home for watching. Uh, we invite you to become a member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation to help us in our vital work to keep state and church separate and to educate the public about the views of non-theists and great work, uh, people like Chrissy Stroop. Uh, you can visit our webpage, ffrf.org, or you can give us a call, 1-800-335-4021. And don't forget to check out Chrissy's work uh, and pre-order her new book, um, uh, Empty the Pews, which is available for pre-order now on amazon.com. And for more information on Andrews and FFRF's, FFRF's upcoming tour dates, you can again visit our website, ffrf.org slash outreach slash events. And we will see you next week for another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. Mm -hmm.